Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Hello, welcome to this episode of Back Garden Biology. Today we're going to be looking at colour, something that everybody's interested in, and particularly how different kinds of colour are produced with a special focus on a phenomenon called iridescence. Now I was kind of inspired in a slightly macabre way to make this particular video by this incident. I was called to my next door neighbour um, over the fence. We have a little gate through our fence between the back gardens as so I was able to go through keeping my distance of course and she showed me this rather macabre sight. An extraordinary thing a magpie drowned in a pond I didn't imagine I'd ever see that because they seem such smart clever birds and it feels very sad actually to see it like that so lifeless. I'm going to try and get it out because we don't want it to rot in the pond. Okay, so when I came back from looking at that, it made me think, wow, the magpie is a really beautiful bird. And I hadn't fully realised how beautiful it was until I actually saw one lying face down in a pond, which is a little bit strange, but there we are. Now, we buried the magpie because so we didn't want it to rot in the pond. And I just removed a small number of its feathers so that we could look at them more closely. So let's have a close up on them. I've just got five of them here a couple of tail feathers and three of these wing feathers. What's interesting about the wing feathers is only half of them have this iridescent quality. So you can see they are bluish um, and the colours appear to shift and change a bit as I move the feathers. The other half just look like they're solid black. And there are three feathers like that. And the tail feathers are a little bit similar. They seem to have, they're more black on this side, but they have this iridescent greenish, bluish quality on the other side. So what's going on there? Well, colour can be produced in different ways. And one way that colour can be produced is chemically through the use of pigments. And that's something we're quite familiar with. And we talked about it in the episode about why the world was green. So if I just pick a typical leaf here, this is from a foxglove plant that just happened to be growing there. This leaf is green and that's because the chlorophyll in there is a pigment. It absorbs blue and red light and it reflects green light and so it looks green and that's how pigments work. That's how all pigments work because we saw again in that episode Why is the World Green that natural light, sunlight, is actually made up of different colours and we see them when the light passes through a prism and they are refracted. Okay, so that's how pigments work, but not all coloration works like that. Some of it is what we call physical, so it's caused by physical structures on the object interfering with light, scattering light, and refracting light to create a different kind of effect. And that's how you can create iridescence. You can't create it with pigments, you have to create it with physical structures. Now, there's one or two examples of physical coloration, and one sitting next to me, and that's why I'm tucked around this corner of the house. This is a blue hosta. And you can see it's got this amazing bluish tinge. It doesn't look green. And that's because it's covered in a special wax. And that wax scatters blue light. So that's a physical effect. It doesn't have a special blue pigment in it. It's scattering away blue light. And in fact, if you leave it out in the sun, the wax degrades and it no longer looks blue and it just looks green. Now, some other plants that like to grow in shade, instead of being blue like that, they have patterns on their leaves. Now, you might be used to seeing patterns on other kinds of leaves, something called variegation. And here's an example of it, where the, the leaves are both green and white. Now, that's caused by pigments. The green parts are where the plant is making chlorophyll, and the white parts are where the plant is not making chlorophyll. 
But some shade leaves look a bit different. They've got this kind of mottled green and white patterns on them. And the whitish bits are not due to a lack of chlorophyll. They're actually due to air pockets that are trapped inside the leaves. And that air bounces light around inside the leaves. And we're not absolutely sure what that's all about, but we think it's a photoprotective effect. So you think, well, why does a shade plant need that? It's growing in the shade. Well, it's because there's always sun flecks coming down through the canopy, shining a little bit of bright light onto a leaf, and that could be really damaging. And we think this ability to reflect light around can help to prevent concentrated damage to the leaves. Now, there's one other really cool way that plants can use structural coloration, and it really does produce genuine iridescence. It's really rare, but there are just a small number of plants, a few begonia species, and a very weird plant called Selaginella that have this bluish sheen about them, a blue iridescence. And that's caused by a very specialized chloroplast. Those are the structures that can contain normal chlorophyll in plants, but they have these specially adapted chloroplasts they're called iridoplasts and they are able to absorb some of that green light that the other plants aren't using. So if you imagine you're right down at the bottom of the canopy, all the good light is gone, but if you can just capture some of that green light that the other leaves didn't want, then you might be able to get a little bit of an advantage. So they are using that iridescence to make the best of the leftover light that the other plants don't want. Okay, so that's how plant leaves can use structural coloration. What about flowers? Well, most flower colours just come from pigments. They are nice, solid colours, like these rather attractive pinky purple tulips that I was growing at the back of my garden earlier this year before they all dried up because the sun's been shining forever. But this is a special tulip. It's called Queen of Night, and it's a very dark tulip, but you can see it's also an iridescent tulip. It sort of shines and gleams and the colours seem to change slightly as the viewing angle shifts. Why do some flowers want to be iridescent? Well, they want to attract insects and insects might be rather sensitive to that iridescence because a lot of them are iridescent and some plants use that to a in a deceptive way. So this is a bee orchid and that is mimicking a bee, trying to attract a bee to come and pollinate it. It's not going to offer it any nectar, it's just deceiving the bee. And the fly orchid does the same. The fly orchid is actually adapted to attract male digger wasps and it produces pheromones that smell of female digger wasps and it's shiny and iridescent so it looks like the shining bodies of female digger wasps. So plants can be pretty tricky as we know. So plants can use structural colour variation but the real masters of structural colour are not plants of course, they are insects. So how have insects become masters of iridescence? Well, the first thing to say about insects is they have a great advantage when it comes to structural coloration because they have what's called an exoskeleton. So we have an endoskeleton. The bones, the hard bits are all on the insides and the soft fleshy bits are around those. But an insect's the other way around. So it's got the soft bits on the inside and it's covered in like a suit of armour, which is the exoskeleton. And that's made from a compound called chitin. And chitin can be sculpted incredibly finely. And some insects have managed to produce multiple layers of chitin uh, very close together, just a quarter of the wavelength of visible light apart. Imagine a little stack of layers. And that's how they can create iridescence, because from each of those layers, a very specific wavelength is reflected back. And the effect of all those layers reflecting very specific wavelengths can create this intensity of colour so that things look metallic and gleam. And pigments just can't produce that kind of same intensity of colour. Now, some insects don't use iridescence, of course. Beetles are very famous for using it, but there are also beetles, like these lily beetles, that just are quite dull looking, just plain red, for example, and that comes from pigment. But other beetles really use iridescence to the max, and one of them can be quite easily seen in gardens, at least in the south southern parts of England. So this is the rose chafer and I found one wandering around on my hawthorn bushes a bit earlier in the year, but also one on a rose flower very, very recently, just in the last couple of days. And they, the adults are just chomping on the pollen, so they're not going to damage your roses, don't worry about it. The larvae feed in uh, rotting, decaying wood, so it's not an insect that you have to consider a pest in any way. And it's really beautiful.
Now, the other kind of green beetle that I'm seeing a lot of in my garden right now is something called the swollen thigh beetle, which is a funny name, but the adult males, as you can see, do have these amazing swollen thighs. They're not present in the females. And they're also kind of a metallic green, and I see them flying around in the long grass in parts of the lawn which I don't mow. The females lack the swollen thighs. That means it's a sexually selected character, so the males have the swollen thighs. They can grip onto the females when they're mating. But we found a dead female on the windowsill in the front, and we put it under the microscope. And here you can see how she's still, even in death, she gleams in incredible colours of green and gold. Now, it's not just beetles. This is a green bottle, a type of fly, something that you don't really want inside your house, but actually its colours are utterly stunning. Another type of insect that's very famous for employing iridescence are the butterflies. So the morpho butterflies that live in the tropics have an intense blue coloration. And our peacock butterfly, which you might find in your garden, also deploys iridescence in those amazing eye spots. So finally we need to ask why. We always need to ask why. We did that for the plants as well. Why do they bother to produce iridescence? We need to ask the same thing for the insects. Well, there's various possibilities about how iridescence could help insects. It could be for crypsis. Often insects, iridescent insects are an amazing green colour and perhaps that does help them to hide. Or other people have said it's about confusing visual predators. So yes, you think it's highly visible, this metallic insect, from a distance as it's flying, but then once it lands, it seems to have disappeared because the angle of the light has changed and it's just vanished into the vegetation. And the final reason is for what we call sexual selection. So that's a character that's evolved to help an animal or an organism get mates rather than to increase its own survival chances. But one of the things you have to do in order to get high fitness, you have to have offspring and that means getting mating opportunities. And we see a lot of sexual selection going on among the damselflies and dragonflies. That's an order of insects called the Odonata. Now, some of them have solid coloration, like this common blue damselfly, but some of them have incredible iridescence, and some of those are flying around right now. So there's two species that we see quite commonly in the UK, the beautiful demoiselle and the banded demoiselle. My uncle went off to find some banded demoiselles at uh, a stream near him in Lincolnshire and came back with these lovely footers. So here is a male banded demoiselle uh, sitting by the river with this beautiful striking blue coloration. Uh, he is very brightly coloured, we think to hold territories, to fight with other males, to compete for the females. Uh, the females are also iridescent but it's a much more muted tone, it's a greenish tone. But as he was filming this one, this happened. And this is a hairy dragonfly who just launched himself at this female, pulled her head off and started eating her in front of him. So, you know, iridescence is there's definitely risks that things are taking as well. It does make things rather conspicuous. And if that's a bit too macabre, in my own garden, I see this wonderful jewel wasp or ruby tailed wasp and she hangs around the bee, net, the bee hotel. She is a cuckoo bee, uh, a cuckoo wasp, sorry, not a bee, she is a true wasp, uh, but she's looking to parasitise the nests of mason bees and mason wasps. She's going to lay her eggs in there and her larvae are going to hatch and they're going to eat the food and they're going to eat the larvae of the bee. So she's pretty predatory herself, but on this occasion, she got caught out because she was nosing around the bee hotel tell and got caught in a spider's web and the spider rushed out to grab her and here that is again in slow motion. Now the spider obviously decided that she was too much to handle and let her go which I was glad about because you know she is really one of the most spectacular insects that you can see even though she's tiny she's absolutely beautiful. Now the last thing we're going to do is just hear from Liam Crowley again, that well-known entomologist who takes some incredible photographs of insects and he's just going to give us a little taste of some of his favourite iridescent insects. Hello, so yeah I'm just going to give some examples of iridescent insects which are, which are my favourite and there's so many insects which are iridescent it's really hard to choose so here's just a few examples. Now within Lepidoptera it's not just butterflies which have iridescent scales and as you can see with this yellow barred longhorn moth and this narrow bordered five spot burnet moth uh, they have spectacular iridescence. Then within beetles there's many many examples of iridescence probably the most of, of any group um, but most people wouldn't necessarily associate these beautiful iridescence with dung beetles but as you can see here this door beetle uh, is very um, shiny and, and iridescent. 
And then with uh, Hymenoptera, um, there are bees which are iridescent uh, on this, the cuticle, the surface of their exoskeleton. Uh, we don't always see it because of the, the long hairs which are characteristic of bees. But as you can see with this Osmia bee, they can be very iridescent. And then finally, I just wanted to give some appreciation to flies, which uh, as we've seen can be very uh, iridescent. Um, such as the, the blowfly we saw earlier. Uh, this is another species of Califoridae, so in the same family, uh, this is a cluster fly and uh, spectacular golden iridescence here. So that's it for Back Garden Biology this week. I hope you can find some of these incredible iridescent things around your garden, whether it's insects or birds or plants. All kinds of things are refracting and reflecting and playing with light in order to dazzle their enemies, dazzle their sexual partners or intimidate their rivals. You know, plants and animals alike are masters of iridescence.